So here we are, Uncertain Dots, episode 14. Uh, I'm Rhett Elaine. I'm Chad Orzel. And we're going to talk about just random stuff. Yeah, we, we did actually get two questions. Oh, two? I only saw one. So The, the first question I saw was, um, why do we have inertia? Is that is that a question? Yeah, so there, there's, why does inertia exist? Should okay. there be a reason? Which, I can answer that one. So why is that? I mean, I think I would refer to, uh, there's a great uh, video uh, with uh, Richard Feynman talking about magnets, and the question is, why do magnets work? And, uh, or how do magnets work? And, and the answer is, the first answer is, well, they do. They attract. And, and it is a good point in science. You know, why is there inertia? I mean, there is. Yeah. And, and we don't answer the why questions as much as model, make models of inertia. And we use inertia in our models for how things interact. But, you know, we don't really answer why, right? Yeah, well, there's the, the famous Newton line, right? There's sort of a, a snotty note in um, one of the later editions of, of his books where he says, uh, um, you know, uh, as to you know, metaphysics, I feign no hypotheses. I said, and I'm, there, there are why questions that I'm, I, you know, I have no ability to answer. Um, you, you know, if you can't test it by experiment, there's no, there's nothing to say. You know, it is right. what it is. Um, yeah, there, there is a famous attempt to explain inertia, I and mean, it's Ernst Mach, who um, uh, famously tried to explain the inertia of objects as due to the gravitational attraction of everything else in the universe. Right? So tried to, trying to say that inertia had to do with um, the gravitational attraction of, you know, the fixed stars, basically, that, that, you know, the reason inertia was related to mass is that everything is gravitationally attracted to the entire universe, and when you're trying to move it, you're trying to move it against all of that. Um, it didn't really work. But it, it was, you know, like the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was one of those philosophical, scientific things. I, you know, I, I ran across it in a book talking about Einstein, who, you know, read read a lot of Mach's stuff and was inspired by some of it. And um, that's one of the things that Mach spent a lot of time on. But it never really never really played out. Um, it's hard to hard to show that that would actually have anything to do with it. I don't think well, anybody that, actually believes that. But that idea is nice in that it does make the connection between, you know, gravitational mass and inertial mass, which is, you know, always a tough thing, too, so. Yeah, I pretty much with that, you just sort of say, well, the equivalence principle. Right? Yeah. You, you can't tell the difference between uh, accelerating due to gravity and accelerating due to uh, random force. And you know, having your whole frame accelerate due to a, a force in the opposite direction. So, but that that goes right back to experimental evidence. That says you can't tell the difference between these two experiments. So, you know, and that goes back to the why do we have inertia? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's uh, I mean, the equivalence principle is tested to to you know very high precision. So, uh, I mean, there's always people trying to trying to do better, uh, but. But it's actually, I mean, it's ridiculously hard to to test to test well to improve the limits on the equivalence principle is is extremely hard. Cause, so what was the uh, what was the second question? Uh, the second question is kind of a, a meta question from Fran Poudry. Uh, so is there any topic in particular you want to talk about on uncertain dots? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did see that. I like the I like the I meta aspect. Of that. I thought she was tweeting all the people saying, "Is there something that you guys want?" She was asking us. Well, I think I think it it has yeah. I mean, it has it's an at reply to me, so hmm. um, so I don't think nobody who uh, the only people who see it are people who follow her and me. So, yeah. So. Or no, not or and. The people that follow her and the people yes, that her her and no, me. just the people that no, just the people that it'd be just the people that follow her. Uh, it would be people depending on what what client you're using. Okay, right. Yeah, you know, most of them block at replies to people that you don't follow. So. Right. Uh, 
so someone would you have to. You've got to click the view conversation. Yeah, or or go to her full profile. I think if you yeah. look at the Twitter thing, um, which is actually what I tend to use because the, I used to use TweetDeck, but then they broke it, and um, once that didn't work on my phone anymore, then I might as well just use the. I don't like any of the third-party clients any better than I like Twitter itself. So. Yeah, I just use the website. Um, so. I mean, you know, I think you're like. A lot like me. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter. Usually, I use it to, to post my stuff. Um, typically, I come in in the in the morning when I get up. I'll look at stuff, and then if I'm you know waiting on kids or something like that. You, but mostly when I'm reading, it's on my phone. And then um, there's a an app that's good on the phone, and there's Flipboard, which I use. Are you familiar with that? Uh, no, I haven't used that. No. It turns it in. It turns your Twitter stream into like a magazine. And so if someone posts a link, you'll put a picture and a short description of what they posted, and you just kind of flip through all the tweets, and it, it makes it look like a magazine. So, you know, if you see something interesting, you click on it, it shows you everything, and it, it's just a little bit different. So Yeah, the thing, I, I mostly use the just the Twitter apps on the phone and on the, I have an iPad, too, um, which uh, the, the irritating thing is it turns out if you click on a link, you know, if you, you tap a link in the Twitter app on the iPad, it opens in a a browser that doesn't have all the features. So, like, you can't see the mouse over text for XKCD comics. So, you know, well, I don't think you can see the mouse over text in any browser on the iPad, can you? No, if you open it, in, if you copy and paste the link into Safari, and then you hold your finger on the uh, the cartoon oh. it'll pop up the mouse over text you, you gotta see, but you have to do it in the full version of Safari you can't do it from within the Twitter app which is maddening and it took me forever to, to figure that out so. but um, yeah I mostly just use the the Twitter apps on those things which works well enough my thing you know if I'm like at Starbucks writing I'll usually have it open in a window so I can you know, procrastinate a little bit here and there, and dribs and drabs to, to do stuff. But most of the time during the day, um, you know, if, if if I'm not actively doing something on a computer, you know, I'm, I'm busy doing something else that precludes tweeting. So, I don't know. Yeah, and then, I mean, I'll, if I find something interesting, I'll tweet it. If someone replies to me or mentions me, I, I usually look at that, you know, because I'm obsessed with myself. But, um, <laughs> You know, so other than that, I'm, I don't I don't really read what people post too much in in the middle of the day, at night and in the morning I, I usually look at stuff. So yeah, it's kind of a terrible form. It's kind of a terrible medium for that because because yeah. if you yeah. miss it, you miss it. It's gone. Yeah, I mean, it's it, there, it's, but it's way it's in the past. Like, it's like a river flowing by, and someone threw something cool in two hours ago, but you don't see it because. Yeah, and the problem is sometimes I'll, I'll catch you know like the tail end of a conversation that somebody else is having. On Twitter, that that looks interesting, but um, you know, unless you're really good about, and, and I try to be good about, you know, replying to the previous post so it all shows up in the conversation um, view. Then, it, unless people are really good about that, it just gets stuff just gets lost. There's just no way to find trace back to whatever pe whatever started the conversation. I think Google Plus is much better for a conversation like that. I mean, you can type more, um, yeah. and it's all it's all kept together. But you know, I, I never I never really use Google Plus for conversations, but I I probably should. But yeah, I, I have a, a small community of friends from um, from my Usenet days back in the '90s, who uh, all somehow or another migrated onto uh, onto Google Plus, and so. Uh, I regularly check that, but even there, like regularly is you know a couple times a day. I look at it and look at what what people are doing. But there's a lot of con a lot more conversation there. Yeah. I think it works better. Um, you know, it's it's a little more like it's it's like what blog comments would be if you could keep out the crazy people <laughs> because you know they do all of the posts that they do. Are are limited to a particular set of circles, and then you know it's only people in there, and you don't. 
you don't have the, the the whack job showing up asking asking completely bizarre questions or or throwing in offensive stuff for no you know no obvious reason. So. Yeah, I gave up on comments a while ago, so I'm no longer in the comment loop. Did you shut it shut it off entirely? Or you... No, I just ignored. <laughs> Look, if people, and people do, if people want to really say something to me, they email me or me, they post on Twitter. And I like it that way because, you know, then I know who they are and everything. So I get people replying to me on email. I just don't, it, you know, if, if it goes on the front page of Wired, I've probably said this before. It's just, no. I don't mean to offend. I think tw I think comments could be very useful. I just. It takes a lot of work to make it work well. Yeah, I, I know if friends who, who have sites with, with really good comment sections and it, it's one of, it takes one of two things. Either you have to be obscure enough that nobody you know that no random idiots show up. And I've I've kind of got that at the moment. I, I, I don't have that. <laughs> I, I have I have you know there's a handful of people who comment. I get actually pretty decent discussions in the the few posts that get comments, um, but if you want lots of comments, then somebody has to actively and aggressively moderate it. Yeah, and you, I'm you not have gonna... to, the the first appearance of an idiot. You have to just you have to come down on them with a hammer quickly. And I just don't have time. I, don't yeah, have... I really don't have time to deal with that. You know, um, I'm I'm pushing the day as it is, and uh, so. And then, you know, I, I don't really, I've, I've already, I want to move on to another blog post anyway. I don't want to think about that one. I want to think about something else. So I, I'm kind of, I have attention problems maybe, but I want to I want to do something else, so. Yeah, I have a tendency to, if I get a really good comment or, or you know, if a, if a good discussion starts up in the comments, I, I have a tendency to, to just... Do a new post based yeah. on whatever. Yeah, no, that's 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 a good idea. Because if I'm going to spend the amount of time necessary to to craft a really good response to a comment, I might as well make it a top level post because it's. Gonna... And it might not even be a comment on your blog post. It could be somewhere else. If I yeah. if I want to comment on something, I might just write a blog post. Yeah, I, I put it on my blog because it because I have a limited amount of time to put put stuff up on the blog anyway, and so right. if I'm, you know, if I'm spending blogging time writing comments either on my own site or on other people's sites that's time that takes away from the limited amount of time I have to post new content on the blog so it might as well just become new content on the blog and typically if I want if there's something I want to say you know I think it's important enough for lots of people to hear it even beyond that blog so it does make a sense I like these times when we have and we've done it before where you'll have a, a blog post and I'll comment, but with a blog post, or, or you know, several yeah. people will. That's always fun. Or like we've done that with uh, some of the Veritasium videos. You know, the the bullet hitting the block video. I don't right. know if you know that one. And, and then so everyone writes a little blog post about it, and then I like that. So yeah, no, that, that was fun. Uh, hey, did you do his buoyancy thing? With the, it was Veritasium, right? That had yeah. The... I don't know. I mean, I don't. I only see the stuff. If it comes up in my Twitter feed or something like that, because I don't follow it regularly. Not that you know, Smarter Every Day and Veritasium, all their videos are great, but I don't keep up with them just because of you know, I'm obsessed with blogging. Probably. Yeah. This hit, this hit the Twitter feed because it was uh, yeah, it had a uh, a ball of some sort floating in in water, and then he poured dish detergent over the top of it and, you know, pulled people on. Is it, you know, so it's floating with a little piece sticking out over the, the, the top of the water and then he's going to pour dish detergent on top of it and ask, you know, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Um, you know, it's going to rise higher or lower than the boundary there. Um, I mean, those are great uh, questions. Neat question. Neat question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because they, everyone, it's a great question because you don't have to know the answer, you don't have to know physics, and you can still participate in making, oh, I, I just think it will do this, you know, and you can come up with a plausible explanation, even if it's wrong, but you're participating in that video, whereas if it was, you know, something like a superconductor uh, and a magnet, you'd say, I don't, I don't know anything about superconductors, so I'm not going to say anything, yeah. but uh, this draws people in, it's a trap, it's really a trap. 
Yeah. It's a trap video. Yeah, no, that, that, that was that was cute. Uh, I like that. And uh, I don't know, so did you did you go did you catch speaking of things on Twitter that that took hours? Did you catch Casey, Casey Rutherford? Uh, I didn't see the I didn't uh, see the rant, but I read the article. What I mean, was it wasn't, a, wasn't a rant. I mean, oh. I mean, he was he was excited about it. He was just saying, oh. "Everybody needs to read this. This you know, active learning is great." So. Okay, so I I, sh I I would like to make a comment though. I mean, you know, I I did I did research in stuff just like this. Um, I mean, I think we all would. I mean, it's hard to say. Someone just come up and say, "Everyone learns by sitting in a lecture and having people talk to them." I mean. There may be some old guys that think lectures are great, but I mean the only way everyone I think everyone if you think about it realizes that you can't learn something without doing something. It's it's an active thing, it's not a passive thing, right? Yeah. So and this this isn't a new idea at all. No. I mean, it's been around for a long time. So uh, the, the, but here's the problem. How, how do you prove how do you how do you support this idea with evidence? That is very difficult because you're trying to figure out what people think, and then you're trying to make comparisons between different, you know, medicines where you have passive lecture and active learning with different people. I mean, you know, you think medical testing is hard to get a control group and all this stuff. This is just, it's just tough, right? Yeah. Oh, it's really hard. And, I mean, so the, the nice thing about this paper is that it's you know it's it's a meta analysis of a couple hundred studies that different people have done. Right. So, you know, so so they get their statistical power by you know putting together lots of other people's laboriously done small studies. Um, and you know, I mean, it's it's not a surprising uh, not a surprising result, really. But uh, but I did like seeing it. Yeah. No, I think and I think it's important to, to point out. I mean, you know, how go go around to a university and and follow a student around. How many of their courses are just plain lecture? Yeah. It would be a lot. And and I mean, come on. We all know this is not the way people learn. But you have to. It takes a lot of time and effort to transition the academic structure and infrastructure around the lecture hall to something else. You know, just based on the, the large classes, how do you make those active learning? It's you, There's things you can do, but it's yeah. not trivial. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's the, the usual problem with the incentives, right? that, that people at places where there's a significant research expectation, you know, the active learning stuff is more labor intensive and it requires a bit more prep time and you know you got to have more people teaching you got to you know uh, put more time into and, and resources into that and that's time and resources that you can't also be spending on doing research and if what you end up rewarding people for is you know less their teaching than the research then you know, it's a rational decision to try to shift your effort to something that's that takes up less of your time, um, and you know, doing lectures is is something that takes up less of of your time. No, that's a very valid point. I mean, and yeah, and, and you know, if you think about it, it's kind of an odd system where they evaluate. They, you know, they for the most part, people, academic faculty are hired because of their research. Um, and then they, they expect them to, to teach, and it depends on how much teaching, depends on the institution, but still, I mean, you don't study uh, education in graduate school. I mean, you don't do that at all, right? Yeah. So it's a really, it's a really strange system. I think, I think we can still make it work. Unfortunately, I think part of the problem that we're getting into now, at least at, the state, at state universities, is this idea that Oh, we need we need to evaluate everything. We need to assess everything. We need to make sure that you know these things are happening. And and what that does is it, and then you know they, it's sort of like uh, the high stakes testing for kids, except they're doing it with faculty, right? Yeah. They make sure that you have X number of students with these scores or whatever, and then you know well now we have to get good scores in these tests. So that kind of uh, you know messes up stuff, I think. Yeah, it's you know. I, it's a tough thing because, as as 
a physicist and an experimentalist, I am all in favor of having data or having assessments of things. And so, you know, I, I approve of the general concept. The, the problem is a lot of it gets used stupidly. And, you know, if you're, if you're just going to look at a, at a number and say, well, you know, this is, this is the number, and that, that's not really all that useful. But the problem is, I think that a lot of times administrators, the, a good example is student opinions of teaching, or however you want to call them. Right. You get a numerical value for that, and it, I mean it means something. But you know, you shouldn't say that's their teaching level, right? It's just it's just right. one small piece of evidence, and it has giant error bars. So let's say it that way. Okay. Yeah. But but it's easy to take a number and say, well, if your number is over this, then that's good. If it's below this, that's bad. But it shouldn't be done that way, but it's easy to do. It's easy to take a number and use it. Yeah, and again, it, it, it doesn't tie up a lot of effort on the part of, you know, it doesn't tie up a lot of resources where, you know, when we do reappointment reviews and we do tenure reviews, you know, we're, we're, we have people observing classes, we have interviews with students, we, you know, solicit statements from everybody and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, is is very resource intensive, and it's hard to, you know, it, it's hard to imagine doing that right on an annual basis. So we do it really, we do a good job of it for the high stakes situations. You know, for for deciding are we going to keep this person around for the next potentially thirty years? Um, then we, you know, then we sink the resources into it. But you know, a but lot I of think... the ongoing things, it's just impossible. Yeah, and also I think it has to do with the difference between subjective evaluations and objective evaluations, right? Uh, you know, you, you say, oh, I think you're doing a great job teaching because of, you know, these things, these things, these things. You can't, you can't always say it's just, you know, the, it, once you turn it into a number, a robot can evaluate it, right? It's yeah. just a number. And, and uh, or my, my 10-year-old daughter can do the annual evaluations because... She can look at numbers just as easily as anyone else can. Yeah. Which, so, which of these numbers is, you know, 15 is bigger than 5, true or false? Right. <laughs> no. No. So. So, yeah. But, uh, all right, I, I, I've actually, I have found stuff like, we do the FCI uh, with our intro mechanics classes. I've found that sort of useful. Oh, I think it's a useful. It's yeah. a, now, it's very useful. But what if you said, okay, I'm going to evaluate faculty based on the gains that students get on the FCI? Then you yeah. take the pre-test and come on, you just destroyed the usefulness of that thing right there. But yeah. <laughs> we're going to attach some meaning to it other than just as a tool, a measurement tool. Yeah. Um, the, the analogy I like to give is, what if they evaluated uh, NFL football players and the teams based on the weight? How much they weigh? Because you know, bigger players weigh more, right? Right. So we're just going to measure the weight, and then that's your pay. The weight is your pay. That's it. You get all these, you know, overweight football players because they're getting they're measuring the weight, right? Yeah. So. So. But you're right. The FCI is very useful, and and it's been a big useful tool in the in the field of physics education because it really brought even if it's not a perfect test, it's not a perfect test. But it's easy to administer, and it shows some big problems that students have, even though it's not perfect. And a lot of people use it and said, "Hey, this lecture thing's not working." So yeah, yeah. I wish there were better. Like the E and M doesn't have the same. There, there isn't a test that has the same, you know, widespread test, you know, documented statistics for it with E and M that that that's quite as good. Well, the problem is, I mean, even, and this is part of the problem with the FCI. In introductory physics, number one, the first semester, I mean, if you looked at what people did, I mean, probably 70% of the class is forces. Uh, right. And so the force concept inventory looks at forces. So that one, that one concept covers most of the class. Now, if you take that to the second semester, you, know, you have electric and magnetic fields, which there is a, a good assessment for electric and magnetic fields, but I mean, there's so many other things in there, and so you can't get that one concept that can really say, oh, that, that kind of represents the whole course. Yeah, and we started doing this uh, BEMA. Yeah, uh, BEMA. Job A and Sherwood 
yeah. I think, are, are either they wrote it or they or they promote it heavily in connection with matter and interactions. And we we started doing that, but we don't have as as large a base of that. And yeah, you know, and then you know, and the problem is. You know, we we're teaching in sections of 18 students. We're teaching like 100 and you know 120 students maybe a year in the intro physics sequence. It's just you know you just can't get statistics on that without you know without spreading it over like four years and then and you never do the class exactly the same way. Right. Twice in a row. But, so. but giving it to the students and saying, look, most of my students, if you, if you try to just use it informally, you say, I give it to my students, look, they're not getting magnetic fields, I don't know why, then that tells you something. You can't, yeah. you can't use it in a scientific study because you don't have statistical numbers for it, but it's still useful. It's useful to you. It's useful to the students, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's good to, good to have those sorts of things. Uh, yeah. And I think you know this going back to this this paper. Um, physics seems to have more of that than a lot of other disciplines. I think because I, I suspect it's a it's a you know virtue of necessity kind of thing because the vast majority of our our intro students go on and do something else, and so you know we've we've had as a discipline more of an interest in trying to improve the intro course to to hang on to a few of those people. Um, you know, to that's partly true. more than more than you know, biology. They're they're looking to weed out people who shouldn't be doctors <laughs> and, and get rid of them. And if they, you know, if if they drive a few people away, well, who cares? I think it's also, you know, there are some big road conceptual roadblocks in physics. You know, force, constant force does not mean constant motion. That's a right. that's a tough problem. And and so we see that right away. We see those problems, and and so I think that these big roadblock issues that they're difficult. They're in biology, but they're more difficult to find, and they're not going to stop you from graduating. I mean, you can you can still do well if you put your your uh, effort into it. But also, I think in in the physics education field, um, they're a little further ahead too because. You have to be a physicist to do physics education research because the content's pretty pretty daunting for a normal person. You couldn't take an educational researcher and have them explore these ideas. I mean, you can, but they have to understand the ideas first. And most people don't understand this idea of force. Most people yeah. don't understand ideas of magnetic fields. So, you know, that kind of made the physics community build their own, uh, you know, educational research group. Uh, you know, in the 80s or whenever that really started catching on because cause no one else really could do it. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of the, the more subtle issues creep in where you have to understand the content pretty well to be able to right. get at it. But, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. I don't know. I, I'm doing e &M for the second term in a row right now. So... Um, which has involved a lot of hastily rewritten labs <laughs> and done, put together an hour before class, which um, we'll see. I, I think it actually worked better. I did the RC circuits today with capacitors, yesterday and today with uh, discharging a capacitor. And rather than doing the, you know, here's the formula, here's the equipment, confirm the formula lab, and, you know, here's a capacitor. See what happens, and then okay, what what happened? It, you know, the current drops oh, off exponentially. Off with the capacitor, is that okay? <laughs> I did. I, I had somebody. Ones, they? I had somebody blow one up uh, yeah. about you know eight years ago. Somebody somebody managed to to wire it backwards and turn it on and and leave it plugged in for for half the class, and then it it sprayed hot sticky silicone oil all over the table that was pretty nasty hmm. <laughs> so I, I tell students that now don't don't do that but but it worked it worked better as a discovery thing I think uh, despite the fact that I you know slapped it together an hour before class so okay so supposedly so, the guy I replaced uh, the guy I retired just before I was hired um, Apparently, was the king of, um, you know, half an hour before class would say, "Ooh, I, you know, 
here's an experiment we could do and whip it up out of you know bailing wire and duct tape. Uh, you know, he'd get some really good experiment and and have it work. And so he just never prepped anything. Uh, and it was apparently uh, uh, apparently just maddening to work with because he would just improvise these labs on the spot uh, that but worked. That worked great, but not for everybody. If we want students to learn about science in the labs, then we shouldn't prep it, right? Because we don't. There's not real prep in science. I mean, prepping is part of the science, so they should have yeah. to do that. So, of course, then we we don't have enough time. But right, they they don't have time to get through all the stuff that you have to get through because they're really taking the class uh, as a prerequisite for an engineering course Which later. Which shows you the other problem. Just don't put time constraints on labs. I mean. Who says it has to be a three-hour lab? Life's not broken up that way. Science isn't broken up that way. Yeah. So, so you know, so probably the, who, who says it has to be a three-hour lab is the registrar. Says it. Has to be. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else needs to be in that room, you know, three hours later. And so you get your kids out of the, out of there so the next class can get in. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that we proved a point here in today's episode. We proved the point that if you do ask a question on Twitter, we do answer it. We do right. answer the questions. So, so sometimes the answer is, oh. So. <laughs> but we did answer it. Yeah. And still, I'm still debating whether Fran's question was a question to us or not. So, um, But ask more questions for... Uh, well, I think I, I think I liked it. You know, I liked interpreting it as a meta question for us because, you know, what would you like to see discussed on uncertain dots is whatever we discuss on uncertain dots. That's right. That's right. Or what do we want to see discussed on certain uncertain dots? Answering questions from you. There. Yes. <laughs> that's like a that's like a causality loop. That, that's that's like the meta question back. It was a really closed <laughs> time like curve of yeah. So of Twitter complete. discussion. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we should end right there. Okay, that's a good place to stop. And we'll see you guys next week. Yep, next week.